On this episode of Still Loading, Jeremy Blaustein. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Still Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today on the show, it is, I have a special guest for you all. Um, you may not know him by name, but I guarantee you know his work. He has worked on games that you've most likely played, especially uh, those of you who played growing up on the PS1. Arguably, some of his most famous games that he's worked on are on the PS1 and PS2, actually. There's a lot of games that he's worked on that are super popular. Um he has worked on games like Metal Gear Solid, Symphony of the Night, and uh, Silent Hill 3, if I remember correctly. Um, am I correct with that, Jeremy? Actually, um, I am behind 2, 3, and 4. So 2, 3, and 4. We have Jeremy Blaustein on the episode today. Jeremy, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I wanted to have you on because... One, I think one of the most underappreciated aspects of video game design and video game development is translation slash localization. And Jeremy here is a translator slash localizer. And there's a difference between translation and localization that I feel like is lost on a lot of people. So if you wouldn't mind to start off, just what is the difference between translation and localization? And how did you get... Well, actually, we'll wait till how you got involved. I want to kind of go back a bit further than that after before we get to that. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, first of all, I don't have any, you know, pat answer for that question because on on one level, translation and localization are the same thing. When you translate something, you are sort of by definition, you're putting it into your own language, which mm-hmm. is the language of the listener. So you're you're already localizing it if you if you want to put it that way. You're you're making it you're making it. Um, understandable for um, the not, not just understandable but approachable you know yeah you, yeah you, you're reaching them in there where their mindset is you're 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 in the mind of both sides and you're interpreting mm-hmm. and translating and so there's always this element of um something more than just converting words so you know getting that right out of the way that on some level they're the same thing but uh i think that when it comes to things like video games or you know, novels or something like this. And then to add on to that, the fact that uh, when you're going from a language that is not related to another language, you've got another level of um, alienness. You know, if you're going from English to Spanish or something like that, you can pretty much take the the sentence structure as it is and mm-hmm. just convert it to that language. These are Latin, Latin languages, and um, there's no mismatch really there but yeah, yeah. Going from english to japanese or japanese to english or um, any other languages that are not linguistically related uh there's quite a bit more of fitting square pegs into round holes you know i could see that um i did take a little bit of japanese in college i well a little i took four semesters i barely remember any of it so i i can't really yeah so uh, you but know. the centric structure from what i remember like the verb ends at the end the verb is at the right, end right, of the right, sentence right, the subject right. is at the beginning of the sentence yeah, like right. there's a there's a whole lot of yeah it it almost the way i kind of equated it and if this is like not the best way to equate it just feel free to correct me it kind of reminds me of how yoda speaks in a <laughs> similar way or like an old jewish guy <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but it's yeah a so so a bagel that's what you want <laughs> oh my god yeah uh it's it, the sentence structure is so <laughs> so different that uh sorry that got me um mm-hmm. that sentence structure is so different that it's it, it like you said, it takes a little bit. So that makes a lot of sense what you were saying, how um, translating, especially Japanese to English, you're almost, you're localizing almost immediately just because yeah, of yeah. having to change the sentence structure to yeah. match English yeah. and English speakers. Right. And, you know, you're, you're, there's like a million other things that you have to take into account, such as, um, you know, the spirit with which uh, someone says a line in English in order to match that same spirit or to, 
achieve the same effect on the audience or to you have to take into account cultural factors you know oh you know a japanese person would never put it that way so directly in this situation so let's hide it a little bit more or you know you know dozens of different little things that you'd only know if you're um you know deeply embedded in the culture but on top of all that what i really wanted to say was that um I think the most underappreciated thing when we talk about translation and localization is that we seem to forget that games have writers. Mm -hmm. you know, there are game writers. Now, if you take a, a Japanese game that was written with a potential audience of maybe, you know, I don't know, 500,000 people. Yeah. And then you ask me to translate it into English, which maybe has an intent, you know, a, a an audience of maybe, you know, 10 times that amount, right? Yeah. And then that English is going to be used for the French, Italian, German, and Spanish translation. Which then increases the audience Which that increases much the audience more because that much you're more. On, based yeah. off that one English translation. Yeah. So then let me ask you this question. You hired a professional writer for the original language. You know, you write a game in English, you're going to hire a professional writer. Why is it that um, someone like myself who is going to provide all the intact, all the text, all of the voice uh, spoken text is not con is considered a translator, but not a writer. I mean, there's nothing in the original Japanese that is there on the paper. When I give you English, it's that's not very there. true. There's nothing that's left of true. the original. And so it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's more like a skeleton of a plot, if you will. I mean, you, you pull from it, the the way that the characters feel in Japanese, you pull from it the emotions that you get, but you don't have anything. You don't have any words left. You you so you're. It's like writing a story that you've been handed a summary of in a way. Yeah. You know, it's it's closer to that than it is to um, just looking up stuff in a dictionary. Now, would you say that applies to all? I, 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 that's a very good point. I, I didn't think of it that I agree like that. You should be credited as a writer in some sense because you are completely reworking it, it almost remixing yeah, uh, after yeah. the translation to an extent. Yeah. But um, would you say that would apply as well to translators and localizers say from uh, where it doesn't require as much, or when you're translating from one language to another, that it is more one to one, like you mentioned, Spanish to English, it, where it doesn't require that much. At that point, you're just translating. Would you still consider that to be something like you you are somewhat of a writer, even in that situation? Or yeah, is it more I still, of a language? yes, is that I, farther apart? No, I still think I still think you're, okay. you're a writer. It's it's just you know the, the difficulty is is. You know, it's, it's just like a game on a different level of difficulty, if you will, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's one level up. But um, however, you know, I would I would temper all of that by saying that um, depending on the type of game, depending on the on the on the game company, the client that hires you, uh, depending on the working, uh, you know, if you have if you're a member of a five member tr translation team and you've got someone wa watching over you to make sure you don't stray too far from the original. And that happens mm -hmm. a lot. They'll say, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, you know, you trying to add something, but please don't add anything. Okay. Okay. You know, and, um, you know, I've worked on plenty of projects where I, I haven't been given enough freedom to really do anything that I would uh, take any pride in or, or consider to have had enough um, original flourishes to, you know, to boast about being a writer. But some games I have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Would you say, just to kind of tie it into what I uh, teased a little bit before, would you say you had more freedom with the original Metal Gear Solid or no? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I had tremendous freedom. And I would say that, uh, I mean, it you're, it shows off your writing ability with that game because a lot of people praise that translation a lot. So no, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, you know, you, you get, you get out of it the work that you put in, you know, and I put in yeah. a, lot, a lot of work on that. So, um, you know, I was probably the top of my game and I put in a lot of work and I was ultra motivated and I was completely left on my own to do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what you wind up getting if you have one person translating something is you get a consistent thumbprint from one person. 
a consistent well, voice almost. So it yeah, consistent have, voice um, where yeah. doesn't have the different tone. Like uh, di- essentially, like you're saying, like translators and localizers. Uh, translators and localizers aren't just that; they are also writers. So you have right the same writing, uh, uh, the same writing rhythm and theme, uh, right. voice throughout the right. whole thing. And so, guess guess what you do when you have a team of four people working on a translation and you want to avoid this clash of tones? Guess what you wind up doing. A lot of meetings, I would assume. A lot of rewriting. No, yeah, you wish, but you don't have time for that. No, what you want to do is writing very bland text in order to uh, remove the um, the uh, um, the distinctiveness that will set it out. You know, will set it apart from other people's stuff. So you get this kind of translation by committee, which is very beige and bland. So would you almost prefer, even though it would most likely take longer because it'd be one person working on it, but would you prefer? I mean, I guess it would be impossible depending on the game, but like if it's, there's no, there's no, the industry cannot give you that time anymore. I believe it, especially with, I'm even thinking of games like at the level of, imagine having to localize Final Fantasy 14. It's an MMO with, you know, can't be done. It would be impossible yeah. for solo. It would be imp- even even with all the time in the world, you'd just be spending years. The game would never come out. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the thing is, um, if uh, if a company has an in-house translation, uh, a well-organized in-house translation department, they can spend a lot more time, and they do spend a lot more time uh, working on these things. Like Square, for example, um, they do so much of the translation on their own. And they do uh, a great job because they the, the translators there, uh, the project managers, the uh, localization managers, they all have direct access to the uh, R and D teams. Mm-hmm. So you know they they can take enormous amounts of time and uh, get really detailed answers about the world that they're translating and all sorts of things like that that uh, freelance translators such as myself never have. The, the time to do yeah we yeah we, I mean, that, we often don't even have access to the uh as a rule of thumb we don't have access to the development team that's so interesting i guess it's just a security protocol thing yeah. but i feel like that would make that would make your job a lot easier to be able to have access to the to the development team so you can understand the context of what you're what you're working on um all right. Uh, before we continue on with this, I want to kind of bring it back a little bit. I want to talk about your personal history uh, and how you got into the industry and just even maybe even a little bit before that. So the question I, I, I normally start off with, but I wanted to kind of get that, that localization question right off the top was um, how did you first get into video games? Was it something you were always interested in or was it something that you kind of became interested in after you kind of started working in the industry? Yeah, I was always I was always into video games, but you know I'm I'm 55 right now, so mm-hmm. uh, a lot of your you know people listening to this are are not really going to get where I came from. Where I came from was a world of um, where electronic games were, you know, like it, like pre video games, you know, like yeah, yeah, you were you know like uh, the first ones I can really recall were the little Mattel handheld football or basketball games you ever see those yes i have i i don't I have any but i even have arrows on it and it's just a little it's just a little light you know that my that yeah, horizontally or vertically you know? i actually have or my uncle had a couple of them and i played them and then also i so a buddy of mine goes yard sailing every, every mm-hmm. week trying to mm-hmm. add to his collection and reselling and all that stuff and he found this isn't a, a football game but the quiz whizzes um sure, i have, yeah, 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 I have yeah. a whole bunch i know it's kind of like a it's it, not really well, a video game but it's an electronic yeah, game type of that's, thing that's the point is that there, there there were electronic games before there were video games you know mm-hmm. all sorts of things i remember this weird game um and my brother's gonna kill me for not remembering the name of it it was a um it was a detective game and uh, it came with cards and a little electronic module. And you would like, you know, press in a code on a keypad on the, on the module. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I, I can't, I can't go into the name right now, but, and so it was a somewhat interactive electronic game. And, and then of course, at the arcades were, were, were just starting, you know, and uh, very early on, there was games like Sea Wolf, you know, and like, uh, I remember, um, Goddamn! What was that called? Uh, death, death, death race, death race. Oh, the, the, one of the one of the yeah. first controversy <laughs> games. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was a kid when when all that stuff was happening. Um, 
born in 66. So in 72, you know, things like, you know, I think that's when like Pong came out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you started seeing stuff like, uh, not the Intellivision. What is the, what was before that? Yeah. I had a little, uh, a little, um, um, I can't think of the name right now. uh, Odyssey. um, Was it? Um, God, I'm blanking out now too. Um, Fairchild channel F. That's another one. (laughs) Just throwing out random names. It was a game that had uh, it had pong and it had squash and it had like tennis and they were like all the same thing, you know. But Odyssey, <laughs> Odyssey two different overlay, different yeah, overlay a, that it, you just place was, on the screen. It was the Odyssey. Oh, it was the Odyssey. That's what I. Odyssey, okay, yeah, we had an Odyssey, you know. Um, so I grew up playing video games, but then it was just a different. It was the original era of video games. So I mean, I was um, when the Super Nintendo came out, I was already a you know pot smoking. Uh, you know, college student, you know, or, or <laughs> high school student, you know. So it wasn't Were like you I was still in the U.S. then in high school too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so how did a pot smoking high school student end up, uh, like, because you you clearly you moved from New York because to I was Japan. a pot smoking high school student. So I mean, I I became a pot smoking college student. And, oh, there you, you go. Know. Just to, just upgraded the level there. Yeah, and so up I, there. I studied Japanese in. Uh, in, in college, um, smoking a lot of pot, learning Japanese very well, but it didn't really set me up for a, a glorious career in, in, in anything. So I, um, you know, I went to, uh, Japan and I taught English and you know, I tried to, ex- you know, extended my, my, my childhood a little bit longer by taking a couple of years of graduate school. Then I, uh, then I, I don't know, in Chicago, Jellico was there, J- the Japan Leisure Company, if anybody remembers them. They were making games like uh, Bases Loaded and uh, mm-hmm. Shatterhand and, uh, you know. Shatterhand is great box art. <laughs> it, I love <laughs> It is great box art. <laughs> oh, that's um, funny. So, uh, so I got a job at Jellico and my twin brother got a job at Jellico too. So we were there at the same time. Um he stayed on a little bit longer after I was fired. And, oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. All right, can you go into that story? Is that something you'd yeah, rather? That's kind know? of a funny story. Now I've told it in other places, but uh, okay. Yeah, basically, um, you know, I would studied Japanese for two or three years, but it's all theoretical at that point. You know, <laughs> like until you actually live in the country, you know. Yeah. It's theoretical, and 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 writing Japanese is a very different um, skill than just understanding Japanese, like especially business Japanese. You, they write things in a, a very specific way that, you know, you can't learn without a lot of experience. Um, so anyway, I was I was, uh, was one of these people that call an associate uh, producer, which means basically, you know, you, you do whatever they say, say to do and um, fling around ideas. It was a lot of fun. But uh, at one, one time, the uh, uh, my Japanese boss asked me to, compile a list for to send compile an email to send to Japan about changes we wanted to make to make to for, to bases loaded three so it would be appropriate for the American audience. So okay. that's what they did then. The you know the RD guys are in Japan and the and it was the same thing at Konami later of course. The basically they write to the the home office in Japan and they you know, they ask for changes. They they get a they get an original ROM, you know, of, of what the Japanese version is like, and they say, oh well, mm-hmm. you know, we got to change this face so it looks a little bit more like a this or that. Uh, classic case is the game Wampum by Jalico. Wampum mm-hmm. was originally um, this weird, um, you know, that Monkey King fucking uh, Chinese legend, uh, the legend, uh, of the the monkey, king. legend of the Monkey King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, some uh, Journey to the West. Journey yeah, to the it's West. Journey to the West. So it was Journey to the West was this game Wampum, right? Okay. That's and it. so, but it's like, you know, an American audience isn't going to know what that, why the hell is a monkey carrying a, you know, scepter and stuff like this. So they asked for a few uh, graphical changes, you know, and okay. uh, one was to, they turned, they wound up sticking a feather on his head and turning the scepter into a tomahawk. And they called it Wampum as a, <laughs> as a Native American <laughs> reference. Yeah. You know, like, you know what Wampum is, right? Uh, I, 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 I Maybe because East Coasters know wampum is a East Coast Indians. They use yeah. wampum was the beads that they used as uh, money. Okay, okay, it's yeah, a play I, on, I, it's I a play on that, actually. Let's let hit, hit them over the head and womp them. Womp. Them. Yeah, that's so, what I. Okay, yeah, yeah, womp them. Yes, it's a it's a kind of. A, 
double. I, I get I get the joke now. Yeah. <laughs> Went way anyway, way over my head at first. Oh, anyway, so I was I was writing this uh, this this letter about the change we wanted made for bases loaded. Wrote it in Japanese. Took me like two three days. And when it was over, I showed it to my Japanese boss, and he read this thing, and he's like, "What the fuck is this? This isn't this isn't Japanese, you know? <laughs> like, I can't understand any of what you wrote. Let's make it, you know, because uh, I had just probably done it so, you know, literally just going through this process of you know replacing words, which you can't do, you know. So, so it wasn't it wasn't in the proper sentence structure. I'm assuming it, then or? it wasn't it it. it it wasn't proper anything. I don't. I don't know what the problem is. But I, I lost my shit right there in the office, and I said, "You know what? They expect me to fucking do. I, you, know, you, you could have helped me with this." Blah, blah, blah. And right in the spot, he fired me for losing my temper. Oh man! Yeah. Oh man! I, yeah. So that was. I, I mean, it, lesson. But you don't translate into. You only translate into your own language. You know. So anyone that tells you, you know, somebody says, "Oh, I translate Japanese to English and English to Japanese," it's like, no, you you don't. Because you don't understand all the nuances that a native yeah. speaker would. I mean, would. you know, I've got three kids who are uh, Japanese, and uh, they're bilingual enough to do it. Yeah. But unless you, you know. Unless you, unless you grew public up. Public school, yeah, you gotta, you know, you gotta be part of the culture. You can't just, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's funny because I actually did. You're, you're talking about wampum. That was, I believe, that was a port, sort of, of Adventure Island. Uh, or sorry, um, oh my gosh, there's a whole rabbit hole chain of <laughs> of Adventure Island, which was originally uh, Wonder Boy. It originally started out as Wonder Boy. There's a if you ever get a chance, you can look up there, like what, the arcade game Wonder Boy. Uh -huh it ended up getting ported so many different ways and so many different places where like, I believe Wampum was the sequel to a spinoff port of like wonder boy two or something like that. Ah. Like it's very strange. How, and the funny thing is the original of that never came over to the U S but the second one did. And it was Wampum. Interesting. Very strange. It was a very strange. I'd have to look it up again. I I actually took a picture because I wrote, I created a whole mat like that 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 meme where you see everyone like the the lady doing math or like the dude from It's Always Sunny like looking yeah. like a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, I yeah, drew yeah. a whole map like that of just like, breaking down <laughs> wires, like wires on the on the wall. There's like, so <laughs> many games because you had Wonder Boy, and then when it got ported to the NES, they changed it to Adventure Island, mm. and then Adventure Island had its own series and has spinoffs of that, and then Wonder Boy continues on and has its own series and spinoffs of that. There, it's crazy. That's interesting. But anyway, um. So okay. yeah. So anyway, that was how I how I got started. I just kind of fell into it, and then um, and then later on, I got into Konami. Um, I had done it. I taught English for a year in Japan, and I got fired from that because I just spoke too much Japanese. Um, and my brother at that time had parlayed his job at Jalico into a job at Konami in Chicago. So okay. he got me, he got me an interview in Japan. So I started working at Konami in Japan in Tokyo while he was working at Konami in Chicago. Oh, we were, okay. We were on opposite ends of the fax. You know that we had, yeah. we, had, we had a daily fax. Two times a day, we'd send a fax. This is pre, you know, pre email. Yeah. <laughs> so, or pre uh, <laughs> pre easy access email. Yeah, I think there was. Least. Yeah, there was there was no email. Yeah, it was ninety three. Well, there was. In, yeah, well, at least at least in our company, we didn't have. Yeah, when they first came out with, I remember they called it Dinchy Made, but uh, it was like for emergencies or something like this. Um, That's interesting. That's crazy. It's it's so funny because I'm sure so many people listening now are like, there wasn't email. It, I I still like I know I'm younger than you, but even for me, like I grew up in a weird not a weird, but in an era where it's like I can still remember the world before the internet and then mm. post the internet. Yeah, yeah. So while I, I did know what email was, it wasn't really something that was accessible to me or my mm. family for mm. a mm. while. Mm. So I, it's, it's always interesting when I, cause I have younger cousins who mm. were born after the year 2000. So all they know is the YouTube generation and so on yeah. and so forth. It's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. But okay. So that's how you got into Konami then. And so did you seek out a job in localization slash translation or was it something that just kind of like they knew you could speak or they knew you could, tr you could read and write in both languages. Yeah, was, and so you went from that. there. 
Yeah, I mean, I was actually I was in the business department at Konami uh, in Tokyo, so okay. I was doing very uninteresting stuff. But uh, I was the only foreign employee. <laughs> yeah, so the R and D guys they they would ask me, you know, what what would you know, what does an American think about this? What is, and that that started to turn into me translating stuff. I have translated like, oh, you know, Animaniacs. You know, we don't know we don't know anything about you know the Animaniacs. We got the license, but so I was the only person that could. You know, so I had to write jokes, Animaniacs style, for example. Really? So you worked on some of the, like the Animaniacs game? For I like wrote the entire, no, I wrote the entire, anim- all those, the whole thing. Really? Is, yeah. Or like, you know, um, Batman and Robin, you know, mm-hmm. like the stage names. The, those are, I came up with all, all those, you know. That's nuts. Towel That's- play, you know. So what mm-hmm. would you say is the earliest game you worked on for Konami? Would it be Animaniacs or was it something uh, earlier? It would have been Animaniacs or um, it might have been like something like Tiny Toons. There was Animaniacs. There was Tiny Toons. There was Batman and Robin. There was um, Sparkster, both Sparksters. There was Snatcher. There was um, uh, Biker Mice from Mars. There was... Uh, oh, my God. I actually have that. The Biker Mice from Mars game. <laughs> Not a yeah. lot of people have that, but I have that game. Um, I Contra Hardcore was the first game I uh, actually directed the voice of. Oh wow, that's yeah. awesome! Yeah, so that and was I, a I PS1 title, it, sure. right? No, no it's, no, it's before PS1 Sega. Is it Sega? Okay, yeah. uh, whoops, yeah. and I am way so that, off. That was the first one I, you know, had to. I'm sure I translated and directed that, but you know. <laughs> I did see up on Moby Games. Did they? This was back in the day, I guess, when they didn't include a lot of the, well, the they credit. Didn't, no, there was no credit. No, there's no credit. There. No, that I mean, even, sucks. Even most that of the, sucks so bad. I mean, even Silent Hill, I don't really have proper proper credit for that. But um, that's so nuts to me because that's such a that's such that, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that's how their game got to another market, and they're like, nah, I don't need to put that. I'm not trying to. Yeah. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to bad math Konami in case you want to work with them in the future. <laughs> but um uh but that's nuts um so okay so you worked on contra hardcore you worked on animaniacs and you also worked on a little title little known title uh symphony of the night Uh, yeah yeah that was that was later after i became freelancer so i okay i was at konami for a couple years um just to get back to the history i had a baby Mm -hmm. living in a little apartment in tokyo and i just couldn't you know i just couldn't do it anymore i was you know it was it's just like you, you, you go to work in the morning, you know, ride the subway and get back late. And I had a little baby in this tiny little apartment and I, you know, wanted to, wanted to be a dad. Yeah. So, so um, I quit and it was, it was, it was two weeks right before the, uh, the sarin ga- gas attacks in Tokyo, okay. um, which was a subway line that I was basically riding straight through. Um that I could see that would be a little rattling. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah, have right. a kid, and the place that you always go to every single day just got bom- attacked. No, I, I quit. Yeah, I quit. I quit two weeks before that happened, so I wasn't on the. Tr- I was actually at the uh, the U.S. Embassy that day getting my my passport or something like that. Um, anyway, so uh, we moved to back to the states, and uh, becoming a translator was uh, something I I could do. I just couldn't. I just didn't want to go back to work. I wanted to grow my hair and go back to smoking pot and you know (laughs) (laughs) i don't i feel like japanese business culture is a very much like you have to be brought up into it especially for someone like you know we you you grew up in the u.s at first and it's so different from my understanding i have no level of reference other than things that i've heard no it's 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 not on you know you probably are not getting it you know a, a wrong impression it's you know it's very especially if you're corporate, you know, I wasn't in R and D and I, I tried to get into R and D and they wanted me to join, but, um, the, uh, the common president was for some reason, he wanted to keep me in the business side of things. I don't know, instead of going R and D and I mm-hmm. wanted to make games. So, um, but yeah, it's very buttoned down and sort of formal and, and, uh, it's, it's backbreaking really, you know, just, just, just Tokyo. It's like riding the subways, you know, Tokyo is a great, great city, but if you don't have time and money, there's no point to, you can't take advantage of those things. You know? Yeah. I could, I don't think I'd be able to, I, I'm not a city person in yeah, general. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't live in the city as, yeah. as much as uh, I know that's where all the game studios are, what, regardless of wherever it is in the world, they, they're usually based out of a city unless it's an indie dev or something like that. I, I couldn't do it though. You've talked to a lot of uh, people. Do you, do you think? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Right? 
making games, right? I mean, so many people are drawn into this industry, you know, through games and through anime and, you know, manga and stuff like this. And they, you know, go into making games. What is the relationship between enjoying games and enjoying, you know, working in a game company? I mean, are people having a great time, make, you know, working in game companies? What do you, what do you think about this? <laughs> I It depends on the culture. Uh, there, there's two things, I think. Two, it depends on the, the culture of the company. Or sorry, one, it depends on the culture of the company. And two, it depends on if you like making games because playing games and making games are super different. For making games, I mean, it, sound, it sounds so great, but when it comes right down to it, you're, you're a cog in a wheel. So you're making games might mean what? You know, like I, that's a, so I've told this anecdote before. So I went to college for game design and I realized mm. as much as I loved learning about how games are made and the, yeah. some of the behind the scenes stuff, it wasn't necessarily something I enjoyed doing right. even, even, and even then I wasn't a cog in the wheel. I was just a student in college. And, but there's an anecdote that my one, my perfect, my, the, the, the head of my department told me or told the class where he had his friend who actually ended up teaching our 3d animation class got offered a job at EA to work mm. on Madden football. Mm. That should be a dream job. That's a, one of the dream. biggest franchises. Yeah. He would have been in charge of grass. Grass. That's it. Yeah. Grass. Mechanics. Just grass. <laughs> Just grass mechanics the entire yeah. day, every single yeah. fucking day. Yeah looking at grass seeing how it animates when yeah. someone steps on it when someone yeah. when the wind blows it and yeah. it's just kind of like i thought it, that wasn't the reason i decided not to get into it it was more just that that's another story for another day but um but it, it illustrates you it know, illustrates reality. the issue it is yeah and not every but not every game is going to be that soul not every that's why a lot of people are turning to indie devs now in all honesty but in fact right. i I um it's not been confirmed or anything like that, but I, I reached out to a game dev to ask him to come on and he agreed. We just have to set it up. But he worked at Ubisoft for years yeah. Yeah. and now he's doing any dev. And I, I don't know the reason him leaving Ubisoft, but like there's a lot of reason people are doing indie stuff because indie is now such a viable market compared yeah. to having yeah. to go to a soul crushing yeah. uh, grass. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. But yeah, that's what I think. I think they're, they're very different. Um, pl- m- making games sounds really fun at first, and some people enjoy it. Like there are some people who like enjoy being uh, like a cog in the wheel of that industry. And mm. like I like being kind of like the like at my full time job. I'm not a higher up. I'm kind of like a middle person, and I like that. I like not having to make all the decisions. I like being the cog in the wheel in that specific situation. But it depends on you know what you're yeah, doing. It can feel don't. really great to be a member of a team. I mean, I've experienced mm-hmm. it um, on a number of the the games that I worked on. A small percentage of them, but enough of them that I I, I I've had the feeling, and it feels great to be mm-hmm. to be a member of of a team making something that you're proud of, and uh, that team chemistry also plays into that too yeah true so we've talked about how you got into the industry we've talked a little bit of uh your various you know job to job uh dealings uh, so what i was curious about what is something that was like what was one of the most fun projects you got to work on it could be something from your earliest memories to something that you've been freelancing i mean you've been freelancing for a while now right yeah, over twenty five years. Twenty five. That so pretty much since you left Konami, or did you ever get yeah. hired by another company afterwards? No, no. Since I, 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 Konami was the last square job I worked. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so what has been one of the most fun job, fun experiences at? Maybe not even doesn't have to be a specific job, but experiences overall working in the game industry as a translator slash localizer slash writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have to say that my mind goes to um, probably Silent Hill two and three, and okay. um, you know, and some of the uh, I did a number of recordings at a studio in uh, New York, um, formerly Taj Studios, where Pokemon was done. I was even meaning to ask about that because you've worked on Pokemon a lot. Yeah, yeah. My um, my sister was uh, the Meowth. voice actor. Yeah, it was Meowth um, for a long time, and that's how I made that connection um but then i i took some of the uh games that i was translating and and asked to do the voiceover for uh, and hired the uh the voice actors at that studio uh so like profile and uh ape escape 2 a couple others um 
there was an air uh, air combat game that I, I did there too. Um, Ace Combat 3, I think. Probably a couple of others that I did at that studio. And, th- and those were always fun because I would go down to the city and, um, you know, work with some fun people. And, and I, I enjoy uh, voice directing because you get to work with a lot of fun people. And this was a fun process. But, um, yeah, Silent Hill 2 and 3 were so rewarding because I there was the voice directing. There was the motion capture directing, which I also did. Um, and there was the, uh, the translation, which uh, I was in very close contact with the team kind of going over it to make sure that we were on the, uh, in sync with the plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was a, a really strong feeling of being a member of a development team. Snatcher was a lot of fun when I was at Konami. Uh, you worked on Snatcher. Yeah, I, I worked on Snatcher. Uh, I was ahead of the localization for that. Um, That's that awesome. About, yeah, I was adopted by uh, R&D 6 for about three months. I changed my offices to work there with them. So we were we were taking the uh, the MSX version uh, mm-hmm. and putting that onto uh, the Sega CD. So there was a lot of conversion there, a lot of graphical conversions, and, of course, the English. And, and then I uh, went to Chicago to direct the, the voiceovers there, and that was super fun, super fun. You, you said that a- after you had finished up in Japan or at Konami and you moved back to Chicago, or no, sorry, did you, were you still working I moved to Kunami? Chicago for a couple of years, and then I moved to Massachusetts, but yeah. Okay, so when did you make your way back to Japan after, you know, you, you moved over mm. there to start at, well, not to start at Konami, but yeah. you moved over there, yeah. ended up starting at Konami, came back to the States. When did you make your way back over to Japan? Uh, I left Japan in 95, I guess. Um, and then uh, we would come back to Japan every year just to bring the kids, you know, for okay. you know, a few weeks every year. Um, and then we moved back here in uh, 2010 when I realized my kids were becoming uh sort of irreversibly American. So I said, well, this, <laughs> so, this, must, this must not happen. So I, so I gave up my pot smoking to, you know, try to reduce the population of Americans. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So, sorry, Americans. I know you're listening, but. Ah, that's fine. We, we have our issues and I, uh, the, yeah, we won't go into that. Um, <laughs> so wait, there's no pot smoking allowed in Japan then? Oh my God, no. Wow. I mean, I know it's a tight up, a uh, buttoned yeah. up culture. I wasn't yeah. sure how. Nope. It's very illegal and I do not mess around with that. That is fair. I don't blame you. <laughs> I do not blame you. Um. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I if, if I can take the moment while you're doing all that to, to talk about what I'm doing right now. Yeah, by all means, go into it. Okay. Uh, so I moved back to Japan in 2010 and I continued uh, freelancing. And in, uh, let's see, uh, I've tried a different, uh, you know, uh, over the years I've, I've started a, a couple of companies. Um, there was Wordbox and there was uh, Zpang and stuff like that. But that was always done with a partner and, and in the end didn't work out. Uh, but in about, uh, let's see, 2000, well, it was really only a couple of years ago that I formally created Dragon Baby, which mm-hmm. is my company now. Started it myself mm-hmm. and uh, we're doing very well. Um, we're a localization company, and we also do voice recordings and uh, game writing. And we started in, uh, let's see, March of 2020. Okay, right before, wow, right before the pandemic started. It was right before, yeah, it was right before the pandemic. That's um, nuts. Yeah, um, and uh, the first thing we worked on was a game called World's End Club. Okay, I don't know if I've heard of that one. Yeah, that was because that's by the uh, gentleman behind Danganronpa and uh, okay, uh, the other one uh, behind um, the uh, Escape series, Zero Escape and such. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So those two guys have formed a company, and we did that into like thirteen languages from the wow. Japanese. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge, huge project. Now, wow. when you when you take on a task like that, do you have to? How much, like, when you're oh, so I should, reading- Yeah, I mean, I should mention that, you know, I mean, I've been a Japanese to English translator all this time, but um, now I'm, you know, I'm a CEO of this localization company. So, uh, you know, what we do is, um, you know, using all the experience that I've gained as a translator, I, I, I can understand things from both sides now, the the needs that translators have, uh, how, how uh, development companies work and what they want, and I can take advantage of all all that knowledge by creating the best environment for doing a good localization you know uh, okay 
keeping all can- channels of communication open in the ways that I was frustrated when they were not as a localizer. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I try to, I try to, uh, I try to make the best possible working conditions for the translators and uh, in that way, make the best possible localizations. That's what so we're you doing. Can, so you can make the best possible product yeah, and put it yeah, out to the yeah, public. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, uh, did you, when you, for the other languages, other than the ones that you are, you typically, the Japanese to English, do you do other languages besides that? Or no, no, do, no. have you had to hire out, like, do you, I, what I'm trying to say is, do you contract out those other languages or do you hire yeah. all within internal? Yeah, this is, this is a good, it's a good opportunity, good question and a good opportunity to, um, to let your listeners know uh, how these things work typically. Games are basically uh, localized either in house or out of house. Yeah. And when a game is translated out of house, your game development company or your publisher is going to hire a company uh, to like Dragon Baby, like Dragon Baby, to handle the localization. Mm-hmm. And in the world of uh, translation, again, um, either a uh, these are called LSPs, language service providers, such as uh, such as us. We either have in-house staff, a bunch of little monkeys working at computers, <laughs> or we go into the into the world of freelance translators, and that's that's for the most part the world of of, of translators are freelancers all around the world. Because if you want to find a talented uh, Spanish speaker, you're not going to find that guy and somehow in somehow Japan or in, him, in, yeah, yeah yeah get him to come work on your computer in your little office. No, it's much much better to scour the world for the most talented people and because if if you want people that know their own culture that are have their fingers on the pulse of what's going on in their own cultures they're in their own cultures yeah that, so i mean that makes yeah. sense yeah yeah so we we hire the best linguists that we can the most experienced and uh we keep them motivated and interested and in feeling like they're uh, a part of the development team you know how I was saying before how how great it is to feel like part of a team. Yep. Feel to yep. you know, and, and so a big part of that is um, doing our best to make sure translators get credited in the way you were saying before about I can't believe they don't get credited. Well, you know, I still run into a, a lot of roadblocks with this. Um, That's insane. It's 2021, and it's one of the most important aspects of the job. It is, and and it's it it's really one of the most important motivators for people who aren't. Yeah. They're not, they're not getting rich translating these games, you know, it's very competitive, but, uh, you know, we're doing our best to, uh, pressure everyone hiring us, you know, yeah, yeah. To, to give credits and stuff like that. And sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we, we run into roadblocks that we cannot overcome yet, you know? And I hope those roadblocks in terms of, especially in accreditation, I hope that really goes away because yeah. it just, it's, yeah. it, I, I, I that's think it's I, really that's interesting. What I was saying, you know, about about thinking of us really, don't think of us as translators. We really would prefer to be thought of as um, producers of game content. Yeah, you know, that's what we are. Because you, you are, yeah. I, I, and it's we create game content, you know. And it's one of those things where it's like uh, I don't think people realize how much of it. Like when you're translating, I, I remember one of the few I I told you off mic. I didn't want to prep in terms of listening to a lot of interviews so that way i wouldn't be like i didn't want to listen to a lot of your previous interviews or read a lot of them because i didn't want to like be influenced by them but Mm -hmm. one of the few ones that i did read just in some passing was that um localizing like translating and localizing poems is one of the toughest things because it's it's, since it's a form you're taking an existing form of art and having to make it and localize it so it's something that would be understood by um a different country and a different culture and that's so difficult because a lot of times poetry is so ingrained into the culture that it's written in so like just that as a even a quick example like it's just something that where you're a producer it's not you can't just do a direct translation because it might it most likely wouldn't make any sense to it's structurally not yeah and structurally it's not the same thing anymore you know it's it's like that philosophical question about the guy who he's got a boat you know and the boat is, you know, it's 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 on the beach and it's falling apart board by board. So board by board, he replaces it, you know, one board at a time every year. He's replacing it. Eventually, there's nothing left of the original boat. They're all new. But boards. you still have the boat. Is so it the same like boat? It, though? Is it the same? Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know. The entire month of December here on Still Loading has been sponsored by Geek Guild. 
Geek Guild is your go-to online store for all of your geeky needs. Whether it's home decor, costumes, vinyl records, and of course video games, Geek Guild has it all. They also offer a unique selection of N64 ROM hacks, games like Dragon Ball Kart, GoldenEye but with Mario characters, and also a really interesting one called Waluigi's Taco Stand. So go to geekguild.com and check out everything they have to offer. So do you have any examples of something like that, whether it's with Dragon Baby or previous of like just like one of the most difficult jobs in translation or localization? Difficult, uh, just in terms of uh, difficulty. Uh, well, sure. Um, I think that those would probably be uh, the puzzles in games, you know, because those are always, almost always, you know, the the the, the Japanese devs have they're doing some kind of wordplay that mm-hmm. uh, just doesn't translate, <laughs> you know. Have like, you? Oh, yeah. sorry, fin- I cut you off. Finish what you're saying. Well, you know, um, puzzles by definition are are meant to be hard to figure out. Yeah. So, you know, if they're doing linguistic, you know, whether it be puns or things that sound like other things, um, oh, here, oh, here, here, here's, here's a funny story. All right. Here's a funny story. This is how I got fired from the Pokemon series. This is great. <laughs> yeah. This is, oh, so you I've, so never, told, that, I've that, never told that, this story. <laughs> that, this is actually story. a good thing because according one, of, I was thinking of doing this. One of the sections of like, basically is Wikipedia telling the truth? Um, one of it says that it says that you still work on the Pokemon series. I don't. No, I don't. You don't. Okay. No, that's good to know. I was going to say it says it I says since two thousand and three. <laughs> yeah, someone's going to have to change that for me. But, um, <laughs> uh, oh, so 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 here's the story about that. Uh, you know, there's uh, Professor Oak. Yes, Professor Oak's got a brother, and the brother uh, has this speech thing where he um, he makes he makes puns based on Pokemon names. Okay. And he'll make a pun. Uh, let's say you, so you study Japanese, so you probably know uh, how to say good morning. Uh, Ohio. Gazima. Right. Uh, Ohio. Gazima. Ohio Gazima. So a kind of an example of professor Oak's brother would be, he would say, um, he might say, let's see, what would be a, what would be a pun in Japanese sounding like Ohio Gazimas? Uh He might say, I don't know. Oh, hi, rice. You know, yeah, right, okay, right. Just I'm just coming, I'm just coming up with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like he's saying Ohio, but he says Ohayashi rice, which is a type of you know, food, yeah, Ohayashi rice. But compounding that is no, he wouldn't say Ohayashi rice, he would he would take the name of a Pokemon. Say it's kind of complicated. He would <laughs> <laughs> let's say there's a Pokemon named um, Hayashi rice, <laughs> yeah, no, no, named like um, god. I, I wish I could come over the better note. Okay, let's go with Pikachu. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He he might say he would take a he would say a word that's starting with a P sound like um, Pimon, like green pepper Pimon, and he would say like I don't know, uh, Pimonchu, right? Yeah. You know, so it sounds like Pimon, green pepper, but he's saying Pikachu, and at the same time he would do that, his face would turn into Pikachu's face. <laughs> This is what Professor Oak's brother does, and they so they, they the give shape him, shifter. Yeah, he's a shape shifter, <laughs> and he's making so he's there's a bunch of things going on. He's shifting the face to the name of the Pokemon, so that that means that you can't change the the name of the Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Okay, so as a translator, oh. think about this now because now Pikachu is easy because Pikachu in Japanese is the same as the Pikachu in English, but every other Pokemon has a different name in English. Yeah, yeah. So now you're asking me to. Make a a pun, and and also he's saying something. He's talking about green peppers here, so I can't but change you, that because that's part of the, you know, he has to, right. But Pikachu and green pepper in English doesn't really right. It might it, it's not right. a pun. You it can't make that into a match. pun. So so I I wrote a um I wrote an email to these guys, these jerks at Pokemon. <laughs> actually, actually, it was the studio who was handling it. Those jerks, um, and I said. All right, so here, here, and I explained what I just explained. You know, Professor Oak's brother. This is what he did. It was the new season too. It was the start of a new season, and he was a new character. So it was clear that this was going to be a an issue throughout the whole season, and we'd yeah. have to figure out a way to deal with this, whether that be graphical, you know, flourishes, or you know, or you just get rid of the joke and you just translate something it. like that. But I wanted a group conversation about this, a decision yeah. to be made. You know, like I'm here to help you, you're here to help me. We're a team. You know, this kind of thing. You know what they wrote back? 
What do they write back? Just translate it. We don't want to hear, you know. Ugh. And I'm like, you know, so um, I don't know, you know, uh, and they were jerks about money too. And, you know, so I don't know. I wrote some kind of response and they're like, all right, you're, fu- you know, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Old patterns never die, I guess, you know. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, I always create, you know, service for myself by uh, trying to be a, you know, trying to do the best job possible. But sometimes people in the middle there, they all they want to say is, you know, just don't bother me. I just do it. You know, don't. Yeah, I, I mean, you are a lot more brave than I am. I would I'm, I would cave like and be like, OK, I'll just translate it. I, I like that. You're passionate, though. Like that's you, you care about the work that you do. Yeah. And that's like. Yeah. I, I think that's something that especially like you would, you would want that as like a publisher yeah. or developer. Yeah. Like you would want someone who gives a shit about what you make. Cause otherwise it's like, you're yeah. not going to, otherwise, like you said, the translation localization by committee, you could hire a group to do that. And actually that kind of leads into another question I had about your company, dragon baby. I know mm. we kind of been jumping around a little bit, but mm. like, uh, with Dragon Baby, how do you? We mentioned before about how when it's translation by committee, you you lose all the individuality of the or the uniqueness of a job because now you have to translate yeah. down to the base common denominator. Right, exactly. Do exactly. how do you avoid that with Dragon Baby? Mm, mm, mm. Well, um, that's a great great question. It it comes down to time for one thing. So let's say you have four translators working on a job. Mm-hmm. You know, you can you can sort of cut up a game cross sectionally, or you know, so hard, horizontally or vertically, if you will. I mean, I've tried to translate games with multiple translators um, by giving everyone a character, or giving everyone a chapter, or you know, different approaches like that. But in the end, um, however much you try, I mean, you can come, you can write bibles. Okay, this character before the the project starts, you know, this character is this type of a character and he speaks mm-hmm. in this way and he uses this kind of pronoun and he sounds like a Texas farm boy. And so the more kind of pre-prep you can do, getting everyone on the same page, the better. So there's that. Okay. Okay. After the translation is done, you know, or even while you're doing it, you know, you've got uh, editors and stuff looking at the things to, to make sure people don't stray too far. Oh, uh, can you make the you know get, get back to this guy? He's remember he's a he's a naive, wishful, blah blah blah. You know, yeah. You got to stay on top of things, but then when it's over, you're also going to have editors uh, working on the thing. The biggest problem with that is that editors are usually paid half of what translators pay, are paid, and they're expected to do magically do work like three or four times faster than a translator. So they're, they're, they're looking at four people's work and trying to combine it into a, um, a consistent voice, for example. Yeah. But they have to be given enough time and appreciation for what they do, you know, basically. Um, and that, that is, that's, that process is probably skipped too much by uh, a lot of people. So they're the less people that touch the text. You know, yeah, and, these, these I, editors, and they have to be great writers. Yeah, it all ties into our theme of just being like the Single underappreciated voice. aspects yeah. of the game industry. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's some, there's some. You know, let's face it. I mean, these uh, mobile games, you know, that you're coming out with the Christmas, you know, the Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas Halloween update special, or Christmas, know, yeah, Christmas yeah, update, yeah. you know, all these things. They're cranking out so many millions of words, you know. And they're on this subscription model and they're, you know, they're making their money through microtransactions and, you know, in-game purchases. And really, let's face it, it's not like the old days where um, a localization that doesn't shine is going to cost them anything, you know? So, it, it, the audience that's in taking that game doesn't really, it's not, I don't want to say they're not as discerning because a lot of people play mobile games, but it's just one of those things that's not really it's not as noticeable because yeah, they're into just, like buffering, you know, but you know, they're into buffers and stuff like that. And, you know, like yeah. getting, you know, then this weapon or, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, but you know, so, so some of my clients aren't looking for the best thing on every single game. And furthermore, they might have millions and millions of words that need to be cranked out in a timely fashion. So, you know, what do I do? Do I say, Oh, sorry. You know, we, we don't do that. No, because, you know, I mean, it's a different, it's a different thing they're looking for. So I don't want to say we're giving them a, 
um, a less good localization. But, you know, we try to match up with well, what, what people are looking for, you know. Well, not even that. You're just trying to make like their their job is probably they probably have a different deadline and timetable and amount of work. So you have to yeah. to get it done by a certain amount of time. Like not trying to say that you cut corners, but you do have to make a uh, uh, you do have to make considerations about what you are able to get done in that amount of time. You can always throw more translators on a, on a project. So if you have a, mm-hmm. a million words, like you said, very with great insight, very early on, the less translators you have, the better uh, sort of quality in a way you're going to have. Well, I mean, that, that came single from person's me. vision. You know, for that. <laughs> well, you have a single person's vision, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You put 10 people at it. You'll have 10 people cranking away at something um, and it will get translated and, you know, you get all your weapon names, all your item names and, and the basic translation will be done. And hopefully it will be done um, at least with no, no visible mistakes, but you're not going to have shining brilliance and creativity. No, 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 no. Not with, not with the mobile games. Not specific. With those, yeah. No. Are there any types of projects that you would like that you look out for that are just like you're excited to work on? Because obviously, oh, you know, being a contractor, I wish I, you, I wish I could tell you what Dragon Baby is working on right now. Uh, okay. uh, let me tell you, it's the it is the it is the golden goose of all game localizations. It is it is. Oh, what I'm excited all, to see that. Yeah, it's what all all localizers aspire to. This it sets the the gold star for you know. For localizations and without going into it are you able to say a release year of whatever this project may be not no company yeah. no nothing but yeah yeah it'll be released next year next year okay so we don't have to wait too long for, for this year. golden goose project yeah, it should that's be, exciting yeah should be in the first half of next year that'll be very exciting then um so a couple other questions that i wanted to ask you i just want to kind of go through some of the like some of like just from what I can see on your credits here, at least on Wikipedia, we're gonna see how, like I said before, how accurate these since it didn't have Pokemon correct. Um, well, you did work on Pokemon, but it says that you were still working on it. Um, we already mentioned you worked on Metal Gear Solid, you worked on Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which, by the way, in preparation for this episode, I one of my gaming quote unquote, I call it, my, uh, I have a series of gaming sins as I describe them of games that I really should have played and have not yet played. Oh. I burned through Castlevania Symphony of the Night over the weekend. I oh, bought good. it on PSN. Oh, good. Started it Thursday night. This is Monday morning. Started it Thursday night. I finished it it's actually. Last week. This last week you played it. Yeah, I played wow. it Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now, I did not beat, spoiler alert for a 20-fucking-year-old game, but um, I did not beat the Upside Down Castle part, but mm-hmm. credits rolled. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I beat that. But I've, you know, I've beaten the original Metal Gear Solid years ago now. Um, I'm not a big horror game fan, but you, like you said, you worked on Silent Hill 2, 3, and 4. Only reason I'm not a horror game fan because I'm a wimp and I don't like being scared. Uh but some of the other ones here that I'm just looking right off the top here that it just surprised me. I'm I, surprised I didn't see Snatcher beforehand. That's a game I want for my collection, but it's mm. fucking insanely yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. Like $500 for the disc yeah. alone now or something. Yeah. in 2. Yeah. That that probably had to be a monumental translation. <laughs> There's like over 100 yeah, that characters. Was, in- yeah, that was a really hard one. Um, we got a text dump and um, actually... The text was dumped in such a way um, we didn't know what characters were speaking, which lines. We only had lines, no character. Oh so you had no context. So, of, yeah, my team had. Oh to, my uh, god! You know, we had to play the game so much and try to figure out. Oh, I think I think this is this character speaking, and um, so, you know, so and, you know, Japanese doesn't have pronouns, for example. So you wouldn't know if it's a he or a she or a or even if it's you know five orcs or one orc or you know what I mean, like you know. There's no plurals either in Japanese, so uh, context was very difficult, and you know we were in a in a rush. So there, there's there's some mistakes in that, but the team was really really um, focused and did it with a lot of love. So I think there was a lot of hit or miss moments, and um, I translated a lot of that stuff with. Uh, That's I had no idea that there was no plurals in Japanese. I knew yeah. about the no gender thing, which. I adore because I remember taking German in high school and why the fuck does a chair is a chair masculine. <laughs> and like, I don't even know if that it could be feminine or could be neuter. Who knows? Like yeah. there's, 
I, the fact that I had to assign a gender to an inanimate object, yeah. I'm like, this is dumb. Why can't I just say the chair? Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But that, that uh, uh, I love that so much. Um, do you ever have to- was probably one tenth of the size of Dragon Quest um, Seven, which we also did. Yes, I I saw that too. And I was like, why you did it? I RPGs now. Do you like uh, localizing RPGs, or is yeah. it something? No, I like it. You do? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't because it's such a you know that's such a text heavy genre. I wasn't yeah. sure how much of it. Like obviously, it depends on the working conditions. Well, of they're course, great too. stories, you know. I mean, you know, um, an RPG really allows you. It, it's always they're always well thought out stories, you know. Um, so that makes it fun. That's so cool. I. Characters. I I can't even imagine. That just seems like so much work. Don't forget uh Shadow Hearts. Yes, Shadow Hearts was another one. Um now that was um especially um Covenant, you know, I was a lot of fun to work on. Um had a great time uh doing the voice recording in uh in LA with the ultra famous Richard Epcar. He uh listeners, I mean, I, he probably has new well, he almost assuredly has newer credits than this one, but I know him most recently from the Castlevania animated show on Netflix. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, he's he's, he's excellent. Yeah. I mean, he's an excellent voice actor, of course, but that's so he was in the Shadow Hearts games. Yes. I have yet to play those, so I don't I didn't have any frame of reference for it. Okay. So okay. actually that that leads me to another question though, because play that one next. Play Shadow Hearts Covenant. It's a great game. Is it? I yeah. have. So the first one was for PS2. I know that. What was the second one also for PS2? Well, actually, Shadow Hearts 2, 3, two, three and 4 I worked on um, and uh, sequentially less interesting, but um, yeah. <laughs> as usually is with <laughs> with sequels. I think that it was PS2. Yeah. Now, yeah, did you it. only ever just thinking of games that get depending on the you know the sequels did you only ever work on the original metal gear solid or did you ever do work on future ones i think kojima handles a lot of his own stuff after mgs1 but i wasn't sure yeah koji pro no koji pro is still is still hiring out freelancers actually yeah. okay cool but um uh no i i that's the only metal gear game i, I worked on okay i was just thinking you were saying how like games got less interesting as a uh, as they got as the sequels mm-hmm. went on i'm like metal gear seems to be a series that defines that in terms of story <laughs> defies that excuse me yeah. they just get more and more over the top in a good way i don't mean that as an insult i, I kind of like how insane the the plot lines get it just makes it fun yeah i was gonna ask uh because we've touched on it a little bit throughout this interview but how did you get involved with starting to do voice direction? Because that's a completely different skill than mm, translation. Mm. I mean, they're yeah, tied yeah. together, but it's yeah. like you're you're directing performances at this point. Yeah, I think that the way I got involved in it uh, is, well, it probably has have to do with the fact that when you translate a script, it's sort of a natural thing for you to, um, you know, oversee how it's being um, performed. I mean, you know, you become so... First of all, you, when you write, if, if if you write the way I write, you have a voice in your head. All the lines that you write, you, you hear them said. So you have obviously the most um, experienced idea of, of what's going on emotionally and how things should sound. Plus, I come from a family, like I said, with my sister, uh, of voice actors. So it was always... She was always doing voices, and and uh, you know I grew up I'm a TV kid from the seventies, so yeah, it was just Anna Barbera was, and all the yeah, amazing- right, all that stuff. So it was just something I was really always always doing at home and always interested, in, and and I I liked it and I was good at it too. So is voice work something that you? always kind of aspired to get into or you thought would be cool to Mm. get into or is it something that like did you push for it once you started getting into the industry or was it something that kind of fell into your lap Mm. that's a good question um i guess or it could be a combo yeah i mean i I would say it fell into my lap you know you can't really there really is no pushing for it (laughs) you can't can't twist someone's arm and say you let me you (laughs) You let me (laughs) you let me direct (laughs) this thing whether you like it or not See how angry I am? I can make your actors do that too. <laughs> okay, okay. So, oh, wow. Sorry, I just I totally just brain farted on my next question. And I, I actually went through all those questions a while ago. We've just kind of been free rolling. I was going to ask now. you a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how was it that, uh, you know, you said that you didn't, um, you know, listen to uh, these other 
uh, podcasts and stuff, interviews and stuff like that. How was it that you knew of my name or my work or anything like that? So I mentioned it a bit off mic, but uh, the Retronauts podcast, they have referenced oh, yeah, you okay. a few times mm-hmm. where um, they talk about um, they, they've talked about your they've spoken about your sister. They did a couple episodes on Pokemon and brought her mm-hmm. up. And mm-hmm. then also they were talking about I think they did an episode on the original Metal Gear Solid and they referenced you a decent mm-hmm. amount too. Mm-hmm. understandably mm-hmm. so that you, that mm-hmm. was your baby. You mm-hmm. you localized and translated that. So yeah, I found I, I've d- learned about you through them, mm-hmm. and then I obviously looked at your credits. I'm like, wow, you really have done a lot. Like, it's not just like, uh, and I don't mean any disrespect to other people who have done this. It's not like they had one major influential game and then they didn't do another one after that. But you've had a lot of major influential games that you've worked on. You know, written for, localized, translated between Silent Hill Two, which is one of the most important games in that series, and Metal Gear Solid, Symphony of the Night snatcher which now it's you know at the time it wasn't as well praised but now it's considered like a gem of the kojima mm. library because it, yeah. it it's one of his only well not only it's one of the only ones that got localized over to the u.s one of his visual novels because mm. um, you don't really see like police knots didn't come over yeah. here yeah um and i've heard really good things about police knots i've been trying to find a way mm. to so there, there was a whole fan translation project. Have you ever actually? This is an interesting. There's a lot question. of creepy you, stuff. There's a lot of creepy, creepy Kojima, like uh, you know, hentai <laughs> over yeah. there. Yeah, I, I, I don't uh, think that, I don't think he'd want that. You know that that. I don't think so either. Yeah. I mean, it kind of you can kind of see some of those influences though with some of the random butt shots in the. <laughs> yeah, right. It's worse. It's much much. It's, it's a it's a whole different level worse. Uh, that's really funny. I mean, there's some um, creepy shit in Snatcher, but but Police Knots like ramps it up a lot. I, I maybe that's why I didn't get localized then, because yeah. especially um, I like Nintendo back in the in you know the NES era. I I would I heard and then, you know it's been fairly well documented that they cha- made a lot of changes to the U.S. releases of the North American releases of their games to avoid any religious iconography and which to, game. Now? Uh, any Nintendo did that to a lot well, of their games. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Some things snuck through, like Link still has a cross on his shield in mm, um, mm, mm. Legend of Zelda, but like you know, they they either they put more clothes on the women or they will. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to think, one of the most infamous ones that I'm just blanking on right now. There, there's a couple like a lot, a lot of RPGs, especially where it involves you killing God. They don't call it God in their translations. Oh, a lot, yeah, of yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that um anything yeah. to i'm proud to say that higher. i'm proud to say that on silent hill 3 we actually had the uh the main character um vomit out god really <laughs> <laughs> she, she, yeah she she expelled god from her from her stomach oh yeah. well <laughs> that how was that how is it uh directing <laughs> that in terms of the voice performance that was pretty funny <laughs> i could only imagine oh, having all right now imagine this yeah, that's pretty right. good. <laughs> yeah, um, no, he was great at doing vomiting sounds. What he would do is he would uh, he would take some he would take some of his co- like coffee grounds and put them into like put them into like his water cup and he put, he would put them into his mouth and slosh it around and then like actually vomit back into his cup to like get the. Ugh. <laughs> that's but now you know why it's so fun to direct because you know i i love stories like that it's like um i don't know if this is true but i heard like one of the ways like the just in terms of getting different sounds this isn't voice acting specific but just like unique ways to get sounds out of anything the mm. way they first got the the nuclear explosion sound was they put mm. a, to- a microphone in a toilet not in the water yeah. but put and then <laughs> just flushed it and it, because of the way it echoed it just sounded like an explosion i don't know if that's true or that true yeah. or not that could be apocryphal yeah. i have no idea yeah. but like uh it's <laughs> it, it's weird stuff like that i i love hearing stories along those lines of how Good voice stuff. actors get into those spaces whether they have to create uh, that's a, mark hamill's yeah. infamous for that not infamous oh, but yeah. famous for mm. for doing crazy like mm. ex, like postures and everything yeah. just to get yeah. the voices that he wants yeah. out of his characters yeah yeah it's, it's um it's, with you name a name if you can but what's one of the craziest things you've seen in a voice recording studio oh. you don't have to name a name if it's a if it's uh incriminating <laughs> okay one of the craziest things i've seen in a voice recording studio 
Well, I'm tempted to go to um, Shadow Hearts 2 Covenant. Um, we had this guy. He's passed away since then. Um, but, uh, you know, so I won't, I won't say anything other than the fact that he was just, he was just, just a bundle of energy in there. He was just, I don't know what he was on or what, but he was, you know, he was, he was on life. He did. He just did the best voices. Um, he did. Um, if, for those of you who played it, he, he, he was the voice of, um, Rasputin, for example, just the best fucking voice. That guy, he was so great. Um, and he played other characters in the game as well. I don't, he, he just ad libbed, you know, with just insane brilliance and, and uh, just so talented, man. It was just crazy, that guy. I don't remember his name, the actor's name, but somebody is probably going to look it up. Um, I could look it up real quick. Yeah. Um, what was his kid? Rasputin? Yeah, he played Rasputin. He also played the uh, the Indian uh, wrestler at the Man Festival. Let's see. Let's see if I can. Um, that's that's great. I, I love learning about stuff like that, though, where improvisers are so talented i love i love people who are able to improvise on the spot like you ever heard of a podcast called comedy bang bang called what comedy bang bang no uh, maybe if you like improv comedy i would suggest mm. checking mm. it out um mm. it is ba- it's this host scott ackerman um who he he's not well he's kind of a character of himself but he usually has some type of celebrity on who's promoting something and then they go on, they have comedians who come on, but they're in character as somebody or mm, something. Mm, mm. And it's very fun. It, there's a lot of episodes. So like there's a lot behind the paywall, a paywall right now, but uh, it's really funny because they have, some of the characters are just insane. Some of them are just, you know, normal, but they have insane con like they have insane characteristics. One of my favorites there is uh Oh, Rasputin, by the way, was Bob Pappenbrook. Yeah. Bob. Bob Paddenbrook, yeah. But he was credited as John Smallberries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a joke? <laughs> no, it was a union thing, you know. Uh, of course, of course yeah. it was. Oh, talk, you know who else was so amazing on this guy? This guy, Ardright Chamberlain. Uh, he played Nikolai. Oh, my God. Because Richard had assembled this cast, you know. Richard Epcar assembled Yeah, he, assembled. he directed it. Wow. You know, I was, and I sat by him as like a assistant director, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So these were That's all like nuts. people that he'd work with a lot. And so he, you know, he knew who was good. And yeah. uh, this thing just has the funniest, um, the funniest cutscenes ever, man. I'm going to have to check out this game then. I have, probably like I said, the, it probably has probably the most entertaining um, cutscenes I've, I've, I've worked on in any of my games. That is good to know. So listeners, if you have not played, it's Shadow Hearts 2 as well, but yeah, Shadow Hearts Covenant, yeah. which I don't know I don't know how it came over. I'm assuming Actually, it's... it was such a great RPG. It was um, chosen as RPG of the year. Um, was it? Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, it came out in the same year that I think Final Fantasy X came out. So it was like... That, you know, that would do like it. Weeks apart, and so it just got like you know, blown away by the popularity yeah, of that. And, uh, and so the brand just, recognition of Final Fantasy was yeah. still at all time high then. Um, but no, uh, with the comedy bang bang thing I was mentioning before, there was a character played by Taron Killam from SNL mm-hmm. who he was on as this guy named Bever Hopox or something like that, who was yeah. a horse fight promoter. He would, <laughs> he would promote horse fights where h- horses would, obviously it was all fake but get into a ring and then beat each other to death. Yeah. <laughs> and to fund all of their uh escapades they also owned a bee farm a honey farm and yeah. so they would take the base to obviously once again listeners this is all theater of the mind just don't think so anyone actually did this he would take the bees and sting the horse's hooves so they would swell up into clubs for the horse fights <laughs> that's original <laughs> It was one of the most insane <laughs> things I've ever listened to. I was laughing so hard. I'm like, who comes up with this? Like, why would you yeah. a horse fight promoter? Um, stuff like that. Uh, there's Matt Besser was also on, and he was a character named Daniel Faraway, where he was a background actor. So mm. his, but his whole shtick was that he was a background actor because he was too anxious when he was up like in the front and center. So the whole episode he's talking away from the mic like this because he's, he can't be too close. Otherwise he'll get anxious. So, oh, he, that's funny. so yeah. the whole episode, he's, he's just kind of talking right? like that <laughs> in the background. It's one of the funniest things that's I've like, ever wow. listened to. 
it's Absolutely. really good. I mean, that might be behind a paywall now too, but mm. every episode's really funny. In mm. any case, uh, I I sing comedy bang bang praises whenever I get a chance because I love mm. that podcast so much. Okay, I'll check that. Um, out. So uh, we're 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 going on for about almost an hour twenty now. So I want to start wrapping things up. Okay. Uh, so I guess before I kind of do, we're going to promote Dragon Baby again and to kind of talk about maybe some of the projects that you can talk about that you've done before and we can use that to promote. But um, before we get to the promotional section, I just want to, I have a section called questions from Courtney. Courtney is my wife. She's been on the podcast before and she's famously knows nothing about the video game industry. She's not into anime. She's not into any type of geek culture stuff with the exception of Harry Potter. So I tell her who I'm interested, who I'm interviewing. She has no idea who anyone is. Oh, so I just okay. d- tell her to ask a question. Okay. So her question for questions from Courtney is if you could eat only, if you could only eat one dessert for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, you can eat all other foods, but when it comes to dessert, it's limited to just this one. Well, that's funny. I've thought about that in the context of food, but not dessert. So yeah, this is just well, I don't, I don't dessert. Have, yeah, I don't have a ready answer for that. Um, I can tell you mine if you want to. If you want to think no, about it, no, I don't want to. I don't want to sort of spoil the fresh, okay. tr- you know, the, the fresh snow <laughs> the tracks on it. Um, let's see. My favorite dessert that I, if if it weren't there, I absolutely would just die. World ending. But I can only eat, <laughs> I can only eat it for the rest of the. Uh, you know, I'd be tempted to say. I might go for these. Um, my wife makes these. Um, I think that you call them flor. I think you might call them Florentines. You know, it's okay. like it's like crispy, you know, like baked almonds in a kind of a you baked. It's it's a multi layer thing. Let's see if they're called Florentines in English. It might be one of these Japanese things where they. Uh, no, I think I think you're right. Yeah, um, they almost Florentines. look like they almost look like cookies, but they're like yeah, they're wafer like little, thin. Yeah, like the ones she makes are like little bars. They're not that thin. The ones she makes, it's like a okay. shortbread bottom, and then on top of it's got this like um, delicious almond, you know, brittle on top. Really. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it's like got that that flavor you get when you bake almonds you know so it's like nutty and deep and that, that's and, uh, they, uh, now i'm actually really so hungry good. but I, I don't know I, I i swear to god i've never I've never thought about that question i was i was ready to say pizza you know i was gonna say pizza, <laughs> you know that would be mine too if it was an actual if it was like full-on food well, it'd be mine unless well, you count pizza as a dessert you never know yeah, what well, <laughs> you, well, you, you have yeah, you have a burger right. and then you afterwards <laughs> for dessert you have a slice of pizza yeah i might do that yeah so no i don't have any great I don't have any great answer to that question. Florentine's good. Florentine's good. I I think that's a good answer. Yeah. Um. I'm looking at pictures of them now, and like I, because I I was trying to picture them as well. I don't think I've ever had a Florentine. I know I've heard of them before. I just oh, actually, yeah. I can see what you're talking about. They're not thin, but they got like a yeah, uh, yeah like they, a, a, a cookie base, and then there's like yeah, almonds yeah, yeah. sprinkled yeah, on top. That's that's the that's the kind that that she makes, and they're just so good. Chocolate dipped on the, the picture I have, see is chocolate dipped almond Florentines. That, that sounds be, good. That would be good to dip them in chocolate too. Yeah. That'd be very good. Um, yeah. So, okay. So to wrap up the episode, where can the people, is there any social media you'd like to remote? And of course, uh, dragon baby, what do you have out that you'd like the listeners to go check out? Well, let's see. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, as far as social media goes, I, I kind of had to voluntarily withdraw from Twitter because it was stressing me out too much. I don't blame you. (laughs) I, I, you know, probably get back on there as a company, you know, just being a company entity at some point. But, um, so I don't really do any, um, social media for the, uh, you know, for, you know, I'm pretty much business to business these days, you know, and my Instagram is really not you know, anything to show off and Facebook's just like, I'm just an old dude doing Facebook kind of thing. So, um, dragonbaby.com is our company's website, you know, okay. You know, I'd encourage people to you know check that out. Um, we haven't put any new announcements on there because the, the production schedule is so long that, you know, I don't think that I'm really, um, have anything that I'm sure that, uh, that, uh, they wouldn't mind if I mentioned No Place for Bravery, which is a little indie thing that's going to come out. No Place okay. for Bravery. People can Google No Place for Bravery. They see it's from a, a great dev company in Singapore, Brian Quick, who does a lot of interesting things. Um, Easebridge, uh, 
East Bread Games. Okay. Uh, there's going to be a thing coming out. Uh, you can get it on Steam. Uh, will be out uh, relatively soon, and that's called. I think the name the name is fluid right now, but it's going to be called uh, Needy Girl Overdose. Um, you know, there's a, and there's a bunch of stuff that we we work on for um, for other clients, other LSPs that we're not even allowed to mention. You know, which okay. makes part of our work. You know, and I've got some stuff working. You know, <laughs> God, I really wish. You know, I wish that I could just you know mention the stuff. Um, NDAs are a pain. Yeah, you know, and 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 even even beyond N- NDAs, you know, you get sort of informal NDAs where you just get the feeling that. It's not the unspoken NDA. NDA. Yeah, the unspoken NDA, you know. I getcha, um, I getcha. Um, well, as usual for, or sorry, is there anything else though? I I didn't cut you off or anything like that? No, you know, just check out um, dragonbaby.com from time to time. You'll see, um, maybe you'll see updates from time to time. But mostly, you know, um, we'll just know that we're working behind the scenes. If you know anyone in the industry uh, and they want uh, some people that are seriously dedicated to the craft of, of uh, game content creation, what we call localization. Just put our put our name out there. I'm easy enough to find and love to work on big games and small games. All right. So yes, everyone go check out dragonbaby.com, especially anyone who's working on games who are who's listening. Um, as for me, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at still loading pod on all of them. If you want to email me, you can email me still loading contact at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, the best way you can do it is honestly give it a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That helps more people find the show. If you want to support me monetarily, patreon.com slash still loading pod, one dollar a month will get you episodes a few days early at a higher bit rate and access to it, a patron exclusive discord the five dollar month tier will get you all that as well as two bonus episodes a month and at the time of this recording i think let me see i don't know when this up ep- this episode's going to come out early december i don't know if i'll have my i'm the, actually the next bonus one will be up but at the, this time the most recent bonus episode that i just finished recording was i did a retro magazine review where i looked through an old issue of the official playstation magazine from 1998 and talked about all the random stuff they were advertising so uh yeah patreon.com slash still loading pod and the most important shout out is the bit by bit foundation the bit by bit foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of children receiving inpatient care at hospitals so if you want to go support them go to patreon not patreon i'm sorry go to bitbybitfoundation.org and consider donating and that will do it for this episode jeremy thank you so much again for joining Thanks, me this Josh. was a that lot of fun like to talk a, to you that's a great that's a great uh cause you're working on there that sounds really wonderful I, my friend Kevin, I actually, I should get him on the show. I should get one of the guys on the show who who founded it. But it's a very small nonprofit. They it was a couple of college buddies who mm. like just love playing games together. They actually all met online and they decided to start up this nonprofit. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's a really it's a really nice thing. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, when I found out, I was like, I've, I do a video game podcast. Like, why don't we partner? And literally, there's no nothing to exchange. I just shout them out every episode because mm. I think it's a good mm. cause. It's great. So. But yeah, that will do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. I had a great time. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Jeremy. And I will see you all next time.